All right, very good. We are just kicking off our second session with the Energy Working Group. And uh, I wanna say my thanks to Patrick for uh, kicking, kicking things off. I always appreciate his insights and the discussion it inspires. Um, so with this second session, if you, it might look familiar. Um, we presented a very similar session uh, last year, um, but decided to include this in this year's agenda as well as um, for two reasons, really. The topics in this came up quite a bit in the year in between, and so that informs us very much uh, what's relevant, what are current topics, uh, as well as this is a large audience, and so it's going to have a very mixed background, and some of the ideas uh, presented here uh, are fundamental uh, to how you're going to approach your solution with Tripwire products. Uh, and so having that common language and understanding will, will really help the discussion within your organization as well as between organizations. So um, before I go any further, I'll just uh, introduce myself just a little bit more. I'm on the professional services side of, of Tripwire as an engagement manager, and I get to work with utility customers from across North America, Canada, uh, as well, a little bit in Mexico. Um, and really all of the things discussed here come from the discussions that I and the teams I work with at Tripwire come from all the discussions we have with our utility customers, so with, with this audience. Um, so I'll be going through a few things. Uh, first, I just will briefly introduce a, a, a maturity model that is applicable for NERC SIP and how to approach it with Tripwire tools. I'm not going to go through the model. It's really just to describe it as, a, hey, the, there is this thing out here, and it's a discussion that we lead uh, or engage with our um, our utility customers many, many times uh, over you know over this past year again. And so it's just a very useful tool. Um, then the real meat and potatoes discussion with topic will be on uh, how to operationalize the SIP baseline with the tripwire approach, and I'll actually walk through that. And I did present it last year, but I have some things that are a little bit, I think uh, I'm hoping will present a little bit better or help clarify the idea, because this, this got referred to many times in the last year. Um, and then I'll wrap up with, I'll try to tie it back to the, uh, the language of, of SIP 10. All right, so just a brief introduction then on the maturity model. Um, so this model, uh, you know, really started to evolve uh, right around or um, just at the end of the SIP v3 days and then just grew from there. And again, it, it grew out of all of our conversations that we had. And so uh, to present about the model as opposed to presenting the model is what I'm going to try and do here and juxtapose how would we talk about this model for new customers versus existing customers. And really, so there's five phases, um, and in a one-on-one -on -one discussion, we would certainly break this down and talk about how it is uh, applicable to your organization, uh, your equipment, the requirements that you're focused on. But it really starts with getting instrumentation if you're a new customer, and if you're an existing customer, then the maturity on this first part really usually is uh, centered around um, Hey, we covered already 80 to 90 percent of the assets, but now you know we want to add additional automation and build on what we have. So it's expanding the coverage. Then the the second phase really um, is more instrumentation. So you're probably familiar with if you have a Tripwire solution, you're probably familiar with the so-called whitelist profiler, which. Uh, will be or is being superseded by the Tripwire State Analyzer, which performs the same function, uh, has a, a new name because it's really a, a whole brand new product, and that just came out uh, just at the beginning of July. So I'll be making all of my discussion around Tripwire State Analyzer, and I apologize, we have a little bit of chicken in the egg. I am probably stealing thunder from folks who will be uh, presenting tomorrow morning and, and doing demos and such, so more to come on that. But everything I'm going to say 
um, about state analyzer applies to whitelist profile, if, if that's what you're familiar with. If you're a new customer, then really at this point, it's just understanding that there is this additional component uh, and it has a number of different features and you're probably not going to start off using all the features right away. In fact, that it would be recommended to crawl, walk, run. Uh, start with just a few key things, probably focus on what's in SIP 10 as applicable uh, or can be addressed with the state analyzer uh, in that uh, regard, and then grow from there uh, down the road. Um, and then a third phase, you know, there are some very clearly required controls not covered by whitelist profiler or state analyzer. So it's adding those uh, for existing customers. It can mean re reviewing and again, looking at either equipment or your interpretation uh, or where areas you wanna focus, could potentially add more controls there. Uh, and then the a fourth phase, which is really a much longer phase is considering the, uh, the how do you know questions and do you wanna add technical controls to collect data to support those? Uh, so for new customers, they may or may not really get to this phase, but I think it's helpful to know that it exists. For existing customers, this is really uh, a potential area of um, expanded use. And yeah, so I, I think some uh, of our other speakers might uh, speak on this topic. I haven't seen their presentations, but I've heard indications. So if, or if we have more uh, questions on this, I'd, um, in this uh, session today, would love to explore this further. And of course, we can do that in a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, then finally, well, uh, before I go to the final phase, just put it in context here. Uh, so I had the SIP requirements grid and the red outlines focus where the uh, controls from the first few phases, first four phases would probably be applied almost always starting in, in SIP 10. I really can't think of uh, an example where that hasn't been the case and then going to the security controls under SIP 7 and 5. But you'll see a lot of orange outside of those and that's where there's more technical controls. So that's really where phase four, uh, looking for the how do you know type of controls. Uh, in some cases and in other cases it's there are some specific tools that definitely uh, can help with the um, uh, phase three explicitly required uh, controls as well. So just a, a different context uh, for those goals. Um, okay, and then the the final phase that emerged, you know, so you, you get good at the, through the first four phases, really focusing on your SIP compliance program. Typically you see an audit happen, uh, over the years, and then that'll shine a light on how effective or ineffective the controls were in OT environment for ports and firmware version usually. So feedback might be, please add additional automation there. Um, or uh, expand uh, going to the right. So you have security compliance initiatives. Uh, maybe you want to apply NERC controls SIP controls to PACs or uh, SIP light controls to water, wastewater, and so forth. So we see that lateral move uh, as well. So again, we would love to have, um, uh, to be able to walk through the expanded version of this and talk through what it means uh, for your organization, as well as get feedback of if you see something different. Um, we very much appreciate being able to learn from our, our utility customers. All right, now, fasten your safety belt. We're gonna talk about <laughs> operationalizing the SIP baseline. I just can't, uh, it's hard to emphasize enough how critical this topic is. And I'm going to introduce it by really first talking, starting with the language of, this, of the SIP 10 standard, because that's really where it, I mean, that's where it has to start. Um, you know, so the the requirements um, that I'm, I would think most people have probably poured over many, many times uh, by now, you know, it says what needs to be monitored in, you know, in terms of what kind of information, how frequently, what your response has to be, uh, things like that. But it is, of course, um, does not say use this tool and use it this way. 
you get to make that up for yourself. The one thing though that still sticks in my head um, these years after reading it is that, particularly when it as a, the language around the baseline references, it's it's looking it's referring to change. And when there's a deviation from baseline, there's a change from the from the quote baseline, right? So that implies doing making a comparison. How did it change? Exactly what changed? So what are you going to compare? So you're logically down to two things. So you're going to compare what's the current state, what's the latest that you have observed on that system uh, to what? So we're going to do a comparison, and this is the key question. And this, <laughs> if there isn't any, any, if there's only one thing you're going to take away, it would be what are we going to compare it to? And the answer to this question then is uh, really uh, where we've seen a variety uh, of approaches emerge and certainly some practices that are, that are better than others. So I'll walk through these a little bit. And okay, there are more approaches than uh, listed here. Um, or what I'm about to list here, but I'll, I'll just walk through a few that have that have come up and, and talk through them in some detail. But we could compare uh, an asset to a reference system. So basically declare a reference system, the SIP baseline, and that becomes a standard for comparison. We could say, oh, um, I'm gonna have one element, which is really tripper and enterprise product jargon. You know, basically the container that has the, the information about the configuration, we could compare that from one to another, one element to another. Um, we could compare alternatively one version to another of the same element. So it's a different approach. And then the fourth one I'll highlight, and really I'm, I'm, I started with what I would consider uh, the hardest to the most recommended <laughs> going down the list here, but the, the final one is have a reference state uh, that this tool is really designed around comparing to so you can take advantage of automation as much as possible um, uh, for doing the SIP baseline assessments, comparison, alerting, and so forth. Okay, so let me break these down a little bit. Um, well, actually, uh, new slide. So why, uh, why is this important? And this is a, uh, an eye chart, and we are not going to read through this. It'll be in the slide deck uh, available for your uh, viewing later. But this is just to illustrate a little decision tree that it's really, this is just the, 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 the third and fourth options that I listed on the previous slide. If you, you know, if you could, uh, if you can expand that and read that, that top center diamond is the decision point. How am I operationalizing my baseline? I've only got two things going off there. So um, there are definitely many more uh, possibilities than two because of the flexibility of enterprise and the creativity of, of folks that are using it. But you can see that you make one decision, you make one choice that's going to put you at making another choice and then maybe another choice, and you're going to end up with a very different day-to-day uh, -day operation of the tool. And some some situations are better than others. So, um, so the, the the whole point of asking this question is to begin with the end in mind, uh, and make sure that you have the scalable processes that you like, as well as being able to support your auto process. So, hopefully, that's a picture that will help um, make it clear that it does matter uh, what you're going to choose. All right. So, let me uh, illustrate here then some. Uh, if you chose this route, uh, you know, so you have your asset and you're going to say, oh, I'm going to have a totally different server. That is my reference system. I'm calling the configuration of that system as my SIP baseline and I'm using Tripper Enterprise. So how would that play out? Well, you would have Tripwire Enterprise monitoring them. You would have rules applied to both uh, servers and rules generate the elements and really what we compare because it's actually the versions of the element that you know the history of those that then uh, gives us the actual details and then that's what has to get compared well you can through the gui do 
you know, you can click through and force it to do a comparison, but it's really not scalable through the GUI. So these arrows of comparison is, okay, I see a change, I'm gonna do a comparison. These arrows would have to be, um, really they'd have to be uh, represent uh, scripted work to make these comparisons um, happen, you know, and reportable um, in mass. Not So to go beyond just the, oh, well, I did it once, you know, comparing one version then, but uh, to make it, you know, because you have to scale this across assets. So just from the how would I implement this point of view, there is um, quite a bit to kind of glue this together. Not to mention, not only do you have an asset to maintain, but you have the SIP baseline asset to maintain as well. So all the patching and everything that you would do for this asset, I presume you would do first. And moreover, all the variety of assets that you would have would have to be reflected probably um, in your set of assets for the SIP baseline. So it's just a tremendous amount probably of, of more work. So um, I've seen folks try this um, and these were um, challenges that they ran into. Okay, moving on to a reference element. All right, so we're gonna skip using a, having a whole other set of assets. I'm just gonna use one, but uh, I'm gonna compare one element to another. So my, I'm gonna have an element designated as the set baseline, but then how does this really work? What's the tool, what does enterprise lend itself to? Well, you gotta have, you know, you're gonna get versions and versions have the actual configuration. And so again, we're gonna be comparing one Ver, uh, version, you know, the content of that, the details of that to another. Um, and again, I can do this on a onesie twosie basis through the GUI, but the reporting, you know, in mass, the processes in mass uh, are not part of how the product works. So you are again faced with developing consider considerable scripting, you know, which would be these arrows doing the, the comparisons and the reporting uh, to make this work. So you can see as one would change, the other change, there's a lot of activity that has to happen to make these comparisons um, uh, play out and, and generate the evidence that you want along the way. Um, I've seen folks try this. Yeah, and again, in practice, it was a ton of scripting and very dependent on the expert who put that together. All right, I'll move on then to a reference version, and I'm gonna avoid using the term baseline for anything other than the SIP baseline. Uh, you might be thinking of certain features in Tripwire Enterprise, which I will uh, not say to keep the, uh, to avoid muddying the waters at all about what I'm talking about for when I say baseline. So my asset, uh, but now I am, you know, and I have rules and elements and I'm gonna monitor the configuration. Uh, configuration shows up in versions, and I monitor the system, I get my first version. And then if it changes, uh, and yeah, so I might declare that first observation as the SIP baseline, and it changes, and then I have built-in features in Tripwire Enterprise, I can review that change and promote it and accept it, um, and then potentially consider that the SIP baseline. Uh, and then that process uh, will continue. So on the plus side for this approach, yes, there are built-in features in Tripwire to facilitate this. You know, the whole um, promotion review process, there's quite a few reports around this um, to look at change in all kinds of different ways. Um, I don't have custom scripting like I did with the previous two. I certainly don't have the whole asset fleet, um, you know, comparing it to the, uh, uh, the very first method, the, and it's intuitive, you know, because the product looks like it's kind of designed around this. Um, the challenge is, uh, why would you even consider anything different, is just the scalability. Um, whatever you have lined yourself up to review by your rules, you set yourself up with potentially a human having to look at all of these and promote all of these. Um, so, and that is a conversation that has persisted, you know, over really the years, certainly this past year where utilities have, have said, I struggle with this. 
that, yeah, we do this, maybe we, you know, and we feel good about the evidence, but man, I, I just can't keep up. Um, and that brings us then to the final fourth uh, approach I'll um, uh, present here. And that is have, having a reference state in a way that is consumable by Tripwire Enterprise that will uh, support the automation of the review process. So I have my asset, I have my baseline defined, um, and I have to jump into a little bit of product jargon here if I'm using the state, the state analyzer pre, um, with a legacy product whitelist profiler, either way, there's an output called allowed. It's basically for this server, what are the allowed ports? What's the allowed software? What are the allowed users? This is a standard output of this of Tripwire State Analyzer and Whitelist Profiler. If you have those in your environment, you automatically already have those. This represent and this is, I think, probably the best representation of the SIP baseline, really, um, if you're using that product. All right. So same story. I have rules, elements, generates versions. I start to uh, have a history developed of uh, a list of versions observed. And so those will show up and State Analyzer runs and evaluates that. Um, and I start to get outputs in a separate report of was the comparison, did it sh was everything observed on my allowed list? If yes, I get green on my report. There could be change. It'll automatically get evaluated and reassessed and put on that report. So there might be a change, strictly speaking, to the output, but as long as it conforms to the standard as evaluated with the intelligence of Whitelist Profiler or State Analyzer, then I still get my all the green I used to have. I still have it going forward on my report. Uh, this allows you to really shift attention just to when does this pie chart turn red as opposed to when do my change dots uh, turn red. Because again, you know, it's doing the evaluation automatically uh, and, you know, you, whether or not you do this, this review process. So that sets you up for potentially not having to do that review process. The, and notice, you know, you still have the full history here of the change. The tool is doing the review, the review for you. It would just be, you know, as soon as something comes up that's not on the allowed list, then you see reports start turning red and alerts start to fire and, and so forth. All right. Um, so we coined this manage to the green uh, as opposed to chasing the change. And that really, I'm starting to talk into this, you know, the final recommendation is, um, you know, be thoughtful about how you're defining the SIP baseline. Do it in a way that is complementary to how the, how the tools actually work. Um, take advantage of automation where you can. So, um, so use a reference state, use whitelist profiler, use state analyzer uh, to do the evaluation and then just look at the reference version. Really, here's where it's kind of a blended approach. Look at the changes to the reference from a change perspective. Look at changes to the system through the lens of the reference to minimize your manual work. All right, then I'll walk through this. What does it look like? And before I walk through again, I'll, I'll just clarify what are the outputs that we're uh, working with here. So this is standard output uh, that I'll describe for whitelist profiler as well as state analyzer. Um, so on the right, I have an actual um, asset, a server named uh, XYZ and it's a Windows box. Uh, and then I have all of my allow lists um, that are defined in whitelist profiler or state analyzer. Some are for windows, some are for specific servers. Then I, as I run, you know, when I, when I run state analyzer, uh, it's gonna do the evaluation. It's gonna see the observed and try to match those up against the allow records. Um, it's gonna then also know as it evaluates it, okay, windows asset XYZ, which records apply to it? And, that it'll generate this so-called allowed uh, element. This is a report of what are the records that could apply to this uh, to this asset. Then there's also outputs that give you 
all of the detail of exactly what was observed, but in different formats. So whether there was a match or not, you have documentation every time you run TSA about exactly what was on that system. Um, and it's just gonna show up as an accumulation of versions in the, the version list. Then pushing to, it's also gonna output what's unauthorized. So in this case, I had a port that did not have a, an allow list record. So I'll see this called out uh, in the so-called unauthorized output. Um, there's uh, an output about what, uh, what records didn't, could have been applied, but were not. So, and it was kind of a, an interesting discussion just last week about, well, is there an output about what's needed? And really it's what's allowed uh, minus unused. That's really what would be, I guess you could call needed. So the idea would be as a practice, you'd wanna keep unused down to zero. Um, and then finally, specifically for ports, there is a uh, file integrity monitoring or FIM output that is, again, it's everything just in a different format. Uh, and specifically, oops, I missed my uh, uh, highlight there. Um, it gives me the range uh, of, a, of ephemeral ports as long as the ob actual observed, um, you know, 6011 is inside of that range. As long as the observed is in that range, it will just tell you that. So that way you get less, fewer change versions uh, in that output if you want to use that one. Okay, this is exactly what it looks like in the tool. This is a screenshot from Tripwire Enterprise, the list of outputs I just described. These are they. So you should be able to open up Tripwire Enterprise right now. And if you're using Wireless Profiler or State Analyzer, you're gonna see exactly these. So all of these use cases are available to you uh, right now. Um, all right, then to walk through the, uh, 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 what would this look like to use these features for the so-called, you know, what I'm putting forward as a recommended approach. So we're doing on the left side, we're doing uh, review and change promotion of the allowed element. That's really kind of method three. And then for looking at the state of the system itself, am I compliant? I'm looking at this chart on the right. So um, I can drill in, I can see more detail here. Um, and if I click on my, uh, uh, where there's so-called failing, or, you know, things are not compliant, then I can get more detail. And one moment while I span my screen here, there we go. Um, this is really small on my screen, but of course, you know, you'll have this available to look at uh, in detail. Um, uh, is a, we'll publish the, the deck um, for everyone uh, at the end of this. Um, but on this, I can see that there are seven unauthorized ports. There we go. So that's what I need to address to become compliant. So here I've, I've opened up the, uh, the, the file that has the allow list records. So this is whitelist profiler style, and I'm showing that so that <laughs> you'll see the demo of TSA uh, tomorrow morning. Um, so this whole part is a whole lot better, but this is probably what people are familiar with. So I would stick with that uh, for now. Um, and so, and I'm just showing here's, here's those, those outputs. And if I go in and I update the allow list records, all I did was just take out the comment character and now I changed the scope of where these records are applied. And if I rerun whitelist profiler or TSA, then there's an update to a bunch of these elements, most notably the allowed element. That's really the one I care about in this scenario because I've allowed more uh, ports um, in this case to be uh, considered justified uh, for the server. All right, here's detail of what the um, uh, actually, you know, is allowed for that, for a particular server. So I'm seeing here the, this addition, this is the SIP baseline changing the way I've operationalized it with the best practice approach. Uh, I can look at the full output here, not just the differences. And now I see this show up as a change the way um, uh, to the SIP baseline for that, for a specific server. Um, so now I can go in and I could review that change. So I'm doing method three, I see, ah, this change happened, it hasn't been authorized yet. Um, if I click, you know, if I set up my reports right, I can drill in and start to see 
Um, I happen to prefer the element view. And now you can see where that change has been, you know, is being reported from. And so I'll go ahead and promote that. And click through that. I can provide a change ticket number. This is just normal usage of Tripper Enterprise. And at the end of all this, I've accepted it. I've added a comment, a uh, promotion ID, and that's going to then be represented as approved change to what I'm calling the SIP baseline uh, for that asset. Um, so um, I still have other ports that are not justified, though. So I should still have you know, all this red still in the pie chart. Um, I'll go through and... Uh, um, oh, now I see that allowed is uh, has the change dot cleared because I've gone through and done that promotion. And I see there's other views and reports here. I'm going to kind of push on a little bit more quickly to make sure I don't run out of time here. Um, but there's just other views. You can see we went from seven down to six. And I went ahead. So just repeat that process for all the ports. And I've gone through and done my change promotion. So now I have all my SIP baseline changes are um, uh, represented here and they I can see they're approved and I have more green less red in my pie chart because I have finally gone through and made sure that all the ports for instance um, are uh, have a justification or have been shut down or you know in this case I made sure they're all justified and that's what it would look like on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis now I see um, I can look at what is actually uh, authorized, you know, my clean evidence reports. I see there's zero unauthorized and so forth. So it's just more views. I went from six down to zero. Um, more views of, of the same. Stripwire has captured all the data all the way through about the state of the system, as well as what you're declaring as your SIP baseline. Okay, so I hope that is a helpful reference. Um, and here's the part where I'm going to try to take this back to, um, let me shift my view here a second, to um, uh, the language of, of the standard. And um, am I, you know, how do I, how can I know if I'm uh, being compliant or not? Like, did I really leave the trail of, of breadcrumbs that I need? Um, actually, I talked through this. This is just reiterating the recommended approach. And so just looking at some of the specific language then. So um, so 10R1, part 1.2, you know, our keywords here, this is my emphasis, of course. We have to authorize and document changes. Well, did we document? We've captured a version every time uh, of the system. Um, we have we can always report on any version we want. Um, did we authorize? Absolutely. When, if we consider the set baseline, the allowed element, I put that through a promotion process and I have a full history of, of that promotion and, and so forth. Um, the, uh, for changes that deviate from the baseline, update the baseline. So, I saw deviation, you know, basically when the server was compared to the standard. Um, I saw that show up as red in the pie chart when it deviated in a way that was that brought me out of compliance or uh, less secure. Uh, and I walked through updating the allow list, which then translated to uh, for us each specific server impacted by that update. I, I'm able to produce the report of what's allowed, and that's showing the update to the baseline and full transparency on the approval uh, of those changes. Um, actually, I just talked through that. Um, so I, I hope that helps paint the picture of and connects all the dots <laughs> as much as possible. And I totally understand how their uh, ambiguity um, and questions around that. It's it's always a team sport to try to put a SIP program together. And there's other folks, some are technical, some are not, uh, to get them on board. Uh, um, but definitely, uh, you know, reconsidering or just at least getting very clear on what your 
your SIP baseline uh, strategy is, being able to articulate that, that could be a, a huge value for your team. Uh, and it, this comes up a lot, and I'll, I'll bring this back to the maturity model, um, you know, how the SIP baseline is operationalized can certainly impact how far you're able to get from a maturity perspective as well on the solution. Um, and with that, that concludes the presentation, what I wanted to, to speak on, and I would like to turn now to questions and discussion. Let me bring up the questions here. All right. Um, here's one for existing customers who, who use the whitelist profiler. Are the expanded features listed in the maturity models of TSA an additional cost? Uh, the TSA is a, it's a separate product. Um, there is a, uh, uh, a cost and, and license path um, from for migrating customers. We we're anticipating that because you know, basically everyone's using the whitelist profiler. Uh, I'll have to defer to the uh, sales on on the details of that, and maybe more of that will be probably be presented on um, tomorrow as well. Um, there are expanded features, um, so there, there was great effort put into having a feature parity. Uh, so all the controls, all of the uh, options that were implemented as global variables in the whitelist profiler, there's carryover of those to TSA. So we're trying to make the transition as uh, painless as possible. Um, it, the data flows back to the same elements in enterprise. So if you're reporting from enterprise for audit, audit evidence and such, um, you'll be able to continue those process. But you have a GUI. Multiple people can log into it. It has a database backend. Um, if, uh, and you can actually even add new allow list records from the GUI. So it's really exciting uh, to see and, you know, um, think there's going to be, uh, I look forward to the feedback, anticipate <laughs> positive feedback on that. Um, let's see. Here is one about SVC host. For SVC host service and ports whitelist, the current whitelist profiler only allows us to monitor at the process level and not the SVC host process and associated service. What is the best option for linking SVC host with the associated service? So the, uh, and just to clarify, the capability today is that the output will show SVC host and then the underlying service. So it'll report both in one line. Um, the uh, allow listing part though, it's either match on SVC host or match specifically on, on the sub uh, uh, service. Um, so Kevin, I invite you if I did not, if I'm not addressing it or maybe there's, I've also seen, um, I'm not saying this is you, uh, or your implementation, but I've seen some very old implementations uh, of whitelist profiler that didn't have the S, uh, SVC host uh, reporting in it. It's really just a matter of upgrade the product. Um, but if if I have reflected correctly what is being reported, um, then, and it's still different than that, just shoot another question. I'll try to get that in the list. There's quite a few questions here. Um, Let's see, for changes, we generate the baseline PDF report before and after the change, then highlight, comment the changes, make sure they match the change ticket patch evaluation as a smaller entity. We can afford this level. Uh, of detail and manual work, I can't bring that line. Let me try to read the whole question here. There we go. Um, before and after the change, highlight, comment, uh, comment the changes, make sure they match the change ticket or patch evaluation as a small entity. We can afford this level of detail and manual work, but always want to optimize, authorize, and document changes, quote unquote, to so the language from SIP 
something we've struggled with automating and have landed on this manual effort. Can you elaborate what would you consider as the primary and supplemental evidence for reference date model? I will try. <laughs> um, so the uh, it is, again, as the allowed element, you're putting that element and just that element uh, for um, TSA controls or whitelist profiler controls through the change audit process. Um, so that's going to have, you know, you're able to capture a promotion comment and a reference to a change ticket number. Um, don't forget also you can put, you make your own custom field in the uh, allow list record uh, referencing, you know, hey, this port or this software, whatever it was, was part of um, plan change, uh, whatever, and provide a reference reference to your ticketing system as well. That's another way that we've seen uh, folks tie that together. So then the reporting becomes uh, focused on using that um, uh, that allowed element. I hope that answered it. Um, definitely, I know there could be more to explore there to welcome that. Um, does this approach that any element change that does not result in an allow list policy failure, failure is not a baseline change per SIP 10? Um, 10 or one. So the answer is in the question. So in that, well, the answer is in how you operationalize the baseline. So again, if you say, if you define your standard, you define your reference as the allow list, that the allow list is your standard, then the system, the asset itself can change. And it, the, the, the change is being automatically compared to what you define as your standard, i.e. your SIP baseline. So the change to the system itself, uh, because if you define your processes as, uh, along these lines, the change to the system itself um, is still conforming to what you defined as your standard, then it's not a change that uh, per uh, SIP 10 or reportable as such. The, you know, as, I enter, as I've heard it reflected to me, it's um, as you change your standard, what is your reference, your set baseline? Yes, you're accountable for that. And yes, you know, you absolutely need to capture or have the system know what, uh, what, is, what is the change, what is, what is the system state at any, you know, any, any time in, in history. And you certainly have that too. It's really just looking at is there meaningful change, meaningful change that a human uh, needs to review. So, long way of addressing it. I, I hope I addressed that. Um, and by the way, we'll have. I'll be in um, one of the happy hour sessions towards the end, um, so we can have some live discussion as well. Let me try one more question in the time, and, and I'm certainly glad to stay over here um, past the top of the hour. Um, does TSA support structured and parsable input and output formats uh, to, like JSON, um, XLSX, to allow for external review and validation outside of Tripwire? Um, input and output formats. Well, it, it takes a CSV as an input today, and the idea really around supporting that was to, for migration on the whitelist profiler. Uh, and offhand, I, I, I don't recall that it supports JSON or other formats for input. Uh, it can certainly generate output about what is in its database. Uh, but I guess behind that, what I'm hearing is a request for, well, there's the review validation and how would you capture that? Would you want that inside or outside uh, of TSA, I think is, is kind of the open discussion, maybe for product uh, or product management to be in as well. Um, let me try one more here. Uh, oh, there's a response uh, about an earlier question. And here's one. Did TSA add an alert for no justifications on ports? Um, there are no alerts added. Uh, all the alerts I've talked about are supported with Whitelist Profiler. So, and I've had so many conversations where folks get very focused on using, you know, a very, uh, a certain set of features, but not other features, which is understandable. I mean, it's just the human factor of things. Um, but it, so 
it'd be worth a double check if the, what was shown here already exists in your environment. And if it doesn't, it probably is because the, probably the product has not been upgraded, even the whitelist profiler. All right, we are at the top of the hour. Um, I ask guidance from Liz, should I take a few more or what, uh, what fits next? Well, I'll do one more. <laughs> I'll just keep going. How do we detect custom software scripts? How do we detect new custom software or scripts with Tripwire? Um, really good question there. So there is a feature in Whitelist Profiler and State Analyzer that if there is software that doesn't register, like if you have homegrown scripts or software that just doesn't register, um, there's a way to, to bring that in. It's just adding a rule in a certain spot in the rule tree and enterprise, and um, it'll be able to pick that up. Um, you have to sort through what, what does it mean to have a version. A really great example would be OSI software, which doesn't register and it has a file. It lists the version as text in a file, it's readable. Um, so it's pretty easy to have that uh, catted out, you know, as content that that's picked up um, by whitelist profiler or TSA. So there's a built-in feature for that. Um, how do we detect new custom software or scripts with Tripwire? You know, I love this. Uh, it goes back to um, some work that was actually done. Uh, I had a, a um, kind of a little Tiger Team collaboration with um, three entities and myself um, at, during the uh, end of, uh, at the sunset of SIP v3. And the folks representing those entities wanted to sort through the, the language and try to figure out what they were going to do. And I was there just to provide, you know, input on, well, what can the product do? Um, and it really kind of got down to clarifying that is what's asked, asked for a uh, discovery or, uh, you know, a discovery type of control, or is it really, really just observing and, and then providing justifications and, and sort of um, and I think, you know, history shows that things went kind of towards the latter where it's really just reporting on, on what's there and maybe not as much uh, discovery. But discovery would be, I mean, I, I consider that a blind, spot, a blind spot from a security point of view. Uh, and it would be really easy um, to set up uh, some monitoring to look for new software. And, and we actually came up with an approach uh, from that group from a few years ago. And um uh, it, uh, I'd be happy to elaborate on it more, but it was it was a pretty small rule set that resulted in a set of elements that didn't change very often. Um, and watching it in action, I, I got to see it for a few weeks. Um, you know, going back after a few weeks, and you know, see, saw exactly that that like somebody installed something that had uh, that included putty, um, and then did some scripting on the desktop, and then put it in the recycle bin. And, you know, so basically the, the rule in Tripwire was looking for executable things and putting those into a view so that you could have a, you know, being able to answer the, how do you know that all the software that you're reporting on actually is all the software? It would be absolutely that tight control. Um, so there's more technical detail under that, um, but uh, that we could unpack and I'll invite that in one-on-one um, -on -one conversation or other future conversation. Um, I'm happy to keep going. Uh, Liz, if there's other guidance, chime in, but I'll just keep going. Um, got a question. Do all of Tripwires follow this, uh, customers follow this process, not how many don't and why? Um, do you see them come back to this process after experimenting? Um, you know, many, Many don't. I mean, in fact, you know, the um, I presented four uh, overall approaches, and there's more than that that I've actually seen. So, and there's a whole lot of, you know, the, the reasons why are, are very idiosyncratic. Um, I have seen uh, entities that over the years developed a completely custom uh, approach that was extremely effective, but it, again, it really depended on expertise of with SIP, with Tripwire Enterprise, 
uh, and with some kind of scripting or coding skill, like that skill set coming together in a person, and then that person staying on forever <laughs> for that to be successful. Um, and then, you know, like in that one specific case, um, that that customer, that entity is uh, very open to like, well, I got to, you know, the person in charge of that is like, I'm moving on uh, to another role or I'm, you know, I need a more scalable way. I want to have a, a vendor that I can hold responsible. So they're entertaining that. It's just as one example. Um, the conversation I see most frequently, frequently raised related to this is just struggle with with the manual work that comes out of the uh, chase, chase the change dot, you know, only using change management, not leveraging the automated change review uh, with the policy approach. Um, so that conversation comes up the most and that's where I'm, I'm pointing out that, hey, you made some choices and you can keep doing that or here's some alternatives. So help, help customers make an informed decision. I totally get that once you have your processes documented and people are using them, there's a value to that, to just keep doing status quo. Um, so just because, uh, you know, there could be a faster way, it, it really needs to be a thoughtful decision to, to make that, that transition. Um, do whitelist profiler CSV files become baseline evidence and should be given to auditors or included in SIP 10 docs. So that used to be the case. Uh, and the challenge with that, when, when that was the case, it was, you know, auditor might ask for that. And then um, somebody, you know, the, the entity then would, <laughs> would share those CSVs. And they're hard to read. It's like, how do you parse that? It's really made for the tool to parse and figure out what applies to an in individual system. And so that's why it was really some years ago that um, the allowed element was added as a, an additional feature, as an additional output to the whitelist profiler uh, so that it'd be human readable on a per node basis. That was always the use case. Um, you, you can, can uh, concatenate all that output if you want to, you know, provide it on a, for a set of assets too. Um, but yeah, um, legitimately then, you know, if you're using that as your approach, you're baseline operationalization, then yes. Um, without TSA, could the recommended baseline management approach be achieved using the policy features in enterprise? Some have tried. Um, you know, before Whitelist Profiler was created, that's exactly what folks did. And I think ports is... Uh, that control is is the control that really is the the proof of the challenge. I can't tell you how many um, different consultants on, on the Tripwire services team, uh, as well as different uh, entities, attempted independently to solve this uh, by writing their own scripts or just leveraging uh, the policy features of enterprise. It's really that added intelligence, doing the comparison, and then being able to provide the justification automatically or, or whatever other fields you want. That was, it was like those things all brought together are just really hard to do um, with just the policy feature. I've seen the closest uh, and most persistent approach to that um, worth considering these days at all is uh, if you're not gonna do uh, port scans on your network devices and you wanna use native output, from those devices about what they say their ports are, and then you're gonna write regex against that. The I've seen entities go down that road, maybe even live with it for a few years in an audit, um, but the thing that they end up having to support is a lot of pretty deep regex to deal with the native output of those network devices. Um, so there's kind of a scalability and, and then depth of skill set to make that work. Um, versus, you know, TSA, if you're willing, if you could do a, a NMAP or port scan with IP360, then you're just editing records at that point to be able to uh, scale that. All right. Um, for maturity model review, would this be a professional service engagement or more of a high level conversation? Uh, this is a conversation uh, that that uh, is could be part of services, but most often this is 
uh, myself or you know someone in my role um, leading this conversation. It's not a, a paid uh, time, so you know, we'd be we'd love to set up an appointment to, to have this discussion. Um, uh, if there's now a GUI, is there not a CLI? Is there an API? Um, there is an API. <laughs> I think this is in reference to TSA. So, yeah. So, so good things there. Uh, next question. I'm being time sensitive here. Does the GUI write to a CSV file like WLP does now? If so, how does the allow list get cleaned up when a device is no longer active or something on the allow list needs to be removed, no longer applicable? Okay, does the GUI write to a CSV like the WLP? No, it has a database backend, so it's putting uh, records into a database. Um, but you could still have old sale records uh, and such. Um, you know, if a device is no longer active, I mean, so there's an integration, there's a, a flow of information between TSA and enterprise uh, so that, because enterprise is still collecting all the configuration data from the assets being monitored. Uh, and it also has all of the node, uh, node group membership and such you would leverage in your allow list records. Um, so there would, there would certainly be cleanup from uh, you know, if you had unused records, but specifically, let's say you have a retired asset, you uh, um, should be able to, I haven't clicked through that use case specifically, but you should be able to look for records for a specific asset. So, you know, if you've made records for just server XYZ, uh, find those and, and be able to delete those records. The place I'm thinking of, um, kind of why I'm hedging my response a little bit, I'm just trying to think through this on the fly, you know, let's say that was a Windows asset and um, you just got rid of that one asset, you would still want all of your allow list records for Windows to still apply to all Windows systems. So I think it's just the just for allow list records uh, scoped to a specific asset, uh, asset, you should be able to search for those and delete those. Ask for that in uh, tomorrow's demo, perhaps. All right, I will do one more and then suggest we close. Um, does Tripwire Integrator have APIs that tie into change management software? Yes. Uh, so there's different ways. Well, the way I would lead with considering is um, uh, Tripwire Enterprise specifically. We have something called Tripwire, Inter Tripwire Enterprise Integration Framework, uh, which is the chassis for various plugins to have that work with different change management tools. Um, so well, I want to jump to the, um, the use case, and tie it in with the recommended approach. Um, so we've actually like, uh, so one workflow then out of the recommended approach is that, well, when a green pie chart turns red, that's when the human needs to react. And that description of the process, a human is looking <laughs> at a report, but certainly the integration I just talked about can also uh, observe and react to that and create a ticket to say, hey, your your green report is not as green anymore. Here are the details um, to go follow up on that. Um, similarly, you know, looking at the, well, what about I've operationalized my SIP baseline as the allowed element and just tracking that? Absolutely. You can integrate um, uh, the products I mentioned and have those changes um, uh, tied into a uh, ticketing system as well. All right. Well, I hope that helped. I'm sorry I didn't get to all the questions. Uh, I look forward to uh, the follow-up uh, discussion. Um, yeah. Thank you very much.